Hello, my fabulous sixth graders. So, I'm coming to you live from my backyard while Ava is swimming and CJ is taking a nap, so hopefully it won't be too loud. You may hear the dogs barking occasionally, but we're just gonna ignore that. All right, so we are on chapter two of the book, Focus, okay? So chapter two, the hallway is empty. It's quiet except for muffled teacher voices reminding me that the next period has already started and I'm late for chess when I can't be. Today is the first game of the year and my chance to prove I'm ready to be one of the 12 people who gets picked to play in the tournaments and help our team win the championship. I sprint across the hall, down the stairs, and over to the multi-purpose room. How could I let this happen? I'm such an idiot. I can't do anything right. I should have asked Senior Campo if we could talk about the quiz at recess or lunch or any time other than during chess. Or better yet, I could have just not messed up. All I needed was to finish the questions like everyone else in my entire class who isn't an idiot. By the time I get to chess, I feel like I might puke. I think about turning around and going to the nurse and giving up on this stupid day. I wouldn't have even I wouldn't even have to lie about about being sick to my stomach because I am. Even though I'm scared of getting in trouble for being dumb and late, I know that playing chess is the only thing that will make me feel better right now. I take a deep breath, push open the creaky door and walk into the room as quietly as I can, trying not to draw attention to to myself. I can feel everyone's eyes on me as I look around for my place at the long tables lined with chessboards and clocks. Every seat is taken except for the one across from Sam, the best player on our team. That's not official or anything, but it's obvious that Sam and Red are better than everyone else. Great, just great, I'm in trouble. Sam doesn't glance up at me when I sit down. Her big brown eyes stay glued to the pieces like she isn't gonna let anything get in the way of her winning. She looks like a chess queen perched in front of the board wearing a denim, a denim shirt and tiny gold studs. It's impossible to tell how small and slight she really is. Lila is sitting next to me, biting her fingernails and making loud slurping noises. She needs to stop chewing so I can pay attention to Mr. Lee. I keep waiting for Sam to say something to Lila, but Sam's still staring at the board between us, like she's too busy thinking about her opening to notice, which is another thing I should be doing. There's a pink hair elastic strangling my wrist. I take it off, spin it around my fingers, and look at the pieces in front of me. I need a strong start if I'm going to win. Uh, only I can think... Only I can't think about anything other than the human garbage disposal sitting next to me. Can you stop biting your nails? I muttered. Lila glares at me. What's your problem? Nothing, I whisper. You're just so loud. She rolls her eyes. Everyone needs to be listening to what I'm saying right now. Not, to, not talking. Is that clear? Mr. Lee looks at me. I nod and swallow hard. Everyone is staring at me like they know I have a deficit that makes it impossible for me to, not to mess up. Mr. Lee tucks his hands in his pockets and walks across the room. We all want to win the championship this year, and your performance and practice is a big part of how I decide who will be competing. We have five regular season tournaments starting next Saturday. I expect all of you to be present and prepared to play. And you have to actually show up on time, Clea, Dylan says under his breath, but loud enough so everyone around us can hear. He leans back in his chair, pushing the front legs off the ground. My face and neck feel hot, and I'm pretty sure I'm turning red, but I don't say anything back to him because I don't want him to ask why I was late. I need to forget about the quiz so I can play my best and win. Any questions before we start? Mr. Lee asks. No hands go up. Okay, get to work, he says to everyone, and then he walks over to me. Let's chat for a minute. I stand up and follow him away from the tables. My heart is beating hard inside my chest. I read the secret t-shirt he's wearing under his thin plaid button down. Death cab for cutie? I think it's a band that's really good. All of the t-shirts he wears have music or plays or books on them. They're kind of hard to see hidden under his teacher clothes, but I usually find a way. I think it's the second coolest part about him. The coolest part is that he's a national master, which is a really high ranking in chess. Our matches aren't officially rated because our middle school is in a league with other private schools where that isn't allowed. So I don't know where I stand exactly, but I'm aiming to be a national master in high school. I'm sorry I was late, I say before Mr. Lee has a chance to point it out first. Uh, it won't happen again, I swear. I don't want him to think I'm full of excuses or bad at school and horrible at following rules, even though I really am. I had a tutor this summer, Chloe Louise. She tried to help me with reading comprehension and being organized, but it obviously didn't make a difference, because I'm still here, the same. Clea, I want you to understand why you need to be on time for chess. Mr. Lee says. If I've selected you to play in the tournament and you're late for our first round, you might be forced to forfeit the game and every point counts. Or 
I could decide to replace you with one of the alternates. Being picked to represent our team is an honor for top players who have shown they ha they're serious about chess. I need to be able to trust that you're going to be here or I won't be able to pick you to compete. Does that make sense? I nod. You can count on me, I say, because I want that to be the truth more than anything. I'm glad to hear it, he says, and smiles. Like he understands that it was a mistake and it's, and it's okay this one time as long as it never happens again. When I sit back down, I hit the clock. Sam is playing white, which means she has the first move. But I get to start the game. And, I, and I'm ready. I don't need more time. I want to play chess so I can stop thinking about everything else. Sam slides the pawn in front of her king up two squares. She taps the clock and writes down the first move in her scorebook. It's a trap, a classic Sicilian setup. I memorized the top 10 chess traps of all time, so I'll be able to use them in tournaments. But I never thought that would happen if someone tried to corner me. I never thought about what would happen if someone tried to corner me. Now my time is ticking away, and I'm not sure what to do. I don't mirror Sam's move because I feel that's really, that's, that feels really right. A trap and traps play on instincts, which means it can't be a good decision. Instead, I move my pawn on the queen side up two squares, tap the clock, and write down what I did. Move, let's go, tap, write. I hum the words in my head as, as a way to sing them into my memory. I need to remember all the steps if I'm going to win. Mr. Lee treats every match like a tournament uh, where we're disqualified if we don't keep a record of the game. He wants everything about playing chess to be second nature. Sam's forehead folds up. I'm pretty sure she was expecting something else from me because she doesn't do anything for almost a minute. It's weird to watch her stall. She clears her throat, taps her perfectly painted yellow fingernails on the table, and glances at the clock. She takes a deep breath and develops her night. Up two squares and over one. Clop, clop, clop. I move my pawn. Sam moves her pawn. Once I get into the rhythm, all I see are the answers everywhere. There are patterns on the board that make it clear where each piece is supposed to go next, like a bunch of connecting mazes that all lead to one place, the enemy king. My heart beats faster. I can't stop tapping my toes. It's a little bug. Uh, I can't stop tapping my toes. I'm stuck in a wood-proof, sound-proof, everything-proof tunnel. All that matters are the pieces in front of me. I started playing chess last year. It was Red's idea. He thought it thought I'd be a natural. We've never been in the same classes except for homeroom, which doesn't count because there are no grades or assignments or homework. I've told him about all of the problems I had in school last year, and he still thinks I'm smart like he is. I want to argue with him about that, but he won't let me. There's a big airplane going overhead. <laughs> the reason I said yes to joining the chess team in the first place was that last year was a hard slash bad for Red. His parents got divorced and his dad moved to a fancy faraway ski town in Colorado with his girlfriend, Barb, a.k.a. Barf, and I wanted to be a good friend. At first, I thought chess was boring and way too hard for me, like math. But once I started playing, I realized it was actually fun. It's sort of like a video game and a puzzle and tennis all put together, except so much better. My next move against Sam is obvious. Take her pawn out with my pawn. And for a second, it seems too good to be true. I stop myself and think about all the possibilities to make sure I'm not being trapped into something that might appear like an awesome idea now, but isn't. Once I played through the, the next few steps in my mind and I'm confident, I let go of my piece. Sam uses her knight to take out my pawn. Good, I was counting on that. I move my knight and, trap the, and tap the clock. When I look up, Sam is placing her knight down. I move my other knight out because I think I can win this way. I know I can. A few people on the team were whispering behind me, but I didn't look up. I'm too busy thinking about the board and Sam and making the next move. Sam captures another one of my pieces and taps the clock without realizing that she's left my, my rook on empty file, which direct access to her king. I slide my rook in a straight line across the board. Checkmate. I did it. I won. Woohoo, Red shouts. I look up. He, I look up and he's standing there grinning at me. There are fireworks going off in my brain, green and red and blue and yellow. I reach out to shake Sam's hand. Good game. My words sound happy like they're bouncing off a trampoline and flying into the air. She shakes my hand back but doesn't say anything. She gives her score sheet to Mr. Lee as fast as she can, like she can't wait to get rid of it. You dominated that game, Red said. You should have seen Sam's opening. I dodged a serious trap. He puts up his hand and, high he puts up his hand and I high-five him. Nice job, Clea, Mr. Lee pats my back. I can tell you've put, 
put in a lot of time. It's paying off. Keep up the hard work. I can't stop smiling because I won, and Mr. Lee noticed that I'm not even better than before, Then I'm even better than before. For a few minutes, I'm floating on a cloud of victory until I remember everything else that happened today. After school, I sit outside on the curb on, by the main pickup area and wait for my mom. There are no other students left. It's just me. Some of the teachers are even starting to leave. Mom was supposed to be here 30 minutes ago, which means I should be doing my homework right now. Even though I'm the one who made up the rule that I have to get started by 4 o'clock, still, it still feels like I'm behind. And after today, I need to find a way to make sure that never happens again. I drop my bag and start pacing until mom finally picks up at, mom finally pulls up at 4.05. Sorry I'm late, she says when I open the car door. I saw we too, Henley squeaks from the back seat. Mrs. B had a special surprise for mommy. Really? I turn around to face her. What was it? Her dirty blonde hair is sticking out in every direction and her cheeks are red and splotchy like she's been running around outside on a snowy day. Henley is all dimples and soft, sweet features. I'm hard lines and lots of reddish brown hair. Chocolate gummy bears. Henley smiles with her whole face. I saved one. She holds out a mushy chocolate covered hand. Thank you, I smile and pop her present into my mouth. She looks out the window and lets her legs swing side to side. I love speech, she says softly to no one in particular. It's more like a question, a quiet announcement. Henley is my favorite person on earth. She makes me almost forget I'm mad at mom for being late. Henley is, has a hard time hearing and speaking up and pronouncing words. It sounds like some of her letters are caught in a warm, sticky pot of caramel. They're gooey and gargled and coated in, in sweetness. Her speech therapist, Mrs. B, told mom that she had to practice using her own voice more. She said I make that, I make that hard. I guess it's because Henley doesn't have to say very much to me. She can point and make a face, and I pretty much always know exactly what she wants. I didn't realize the whole special sister mind-reading thing was hurting her, or I never would have done it in the first place. Henley, as soon as we get home, you're going straight to the tub, says Mom. No, no bath, she shouts. I want to play with Clea. I have to do homework, but we can play, we can play chess or whatever else you want this weekend, I say. I promise. Chess, teach me, she says, forgetting about her bath. Can you, me, and Hilda play together? Duh, I said. We'd never leave Hilda out. It doesn't matter that Hilda's our dog and can't play chess. Henley doesn't like to exclude anyone. Duh, Henley Im imitates me. Thank you, Mom mouths to me. I shrug. I don't like it when she thanks me for being nice to my sister, like it's a chore, when it's not. Once we get home, I go straight upstairs to my room and turn on the thunderstorm soundtrack Cleo Louise gave me. Chloe, sorry, Chloe Louise gave me. It's supposed to make homework easier. So far, all it does is make me feel like it's raining, but apparently I need to be patient and give it a chance. Because any minute now, I'm gonna, it's going to start helping. Hilda scurries into my room and jumps on my bed. Uh, digging and circling three times before finally she gives in and folds herself into a tiny black fluff ball. That's been her thing for the last three months, ever since mom let me visit the rescue dogs at the SPCA. I wanted to adopt every single dog in the entire place because I love animals, but mom flat out rejected that idea and said I had to pick one. As soon as I saw Hilda, I knew she belonged to our family. My first choice to name Hilda was Pumpernickel, because her fur reminds me of Pumpernickel bread, which is my favorite, even if Red thinks it's disgusting. But I felt like coming into a new home with a new family would be a lot of change at once, and Hilda might want to keep her old name, since it was all that was left from her past. Homework. I have to do homework. Although first I have to put on more comfortable clothes. Then I sit down on the floor and look through my, my planner, because staring, because staring right now is going to keep is going to be super organized and, sorry, read that sentence over. Then I sit down on the floor and look through my planner because starting right now, I'm gonna be super organized and prepared and on top of everything. I take out Spanish and math. I need to, to finish both assignments before dinner and then after I eat, I'll do history and science and practice my author presentation for Mr. Lee's English class until it's perfect. My phone is buzzing somewhere. It's not next to me or my pocket. I check my backpack, and then I stand up and look all around my room, but I can't find it. Ugh, seriously, where did I leave it this time? I know it's probably Red calling me, and I can't flake out again on him. I promised I wouldn't, so I need to find my phone now before he stops believing me. I open my closet. The dress I wore all day is on the floor. I kick it away, but my phone isn't there. 
that's when I remember I didn't have school. I didn't have it at school. It's still on my bed where I left it this morning. I grab it and call Red back. I hate waiting for my dad to call, Red says as soon as he picks up. He's always late and I don't need to be reminded that he doesn't care about me. He moved to Colorado, so that's pretty clear. I'm sorry, I say. The worst part is that I actually, I was actually excited to tell him about chess and, and now I'm just mad that he's late. I sit back down on the floor next to my backpack. That really stinks. Yeah, it does. Can you stay on the phone until he calls? Of course, I say, because I'm glad there's something I can do to help. It might be kind of, kind of a while. Last time I waited 45 minutes. I'm not hanging up, I say. Thanks. He takes a deep breath like he's relieved. It's already 5.06 p.m. I glance down at my blank worksheet in front of me. But I need to do homework while we wait. I kind of have a lot. Me too, he says. There's so much more this year. You think so? I thought it was just me. No way. Seventh grade is a lot harder. It feels good to hear him say that, like we're the same. And maybe if I work hard from now on, I could fix my grades and still play chess. <laughs> Ava fell in the pool. Saw that. I put my phone on speaker so I don't have to hold it up to my ear while I stare at Spanish. Cleo, why is it raining in your room? He asks. Oh, I forgot that was on. It's supposed to help me concentrate or whatever. Does it? Um, yeah. I say, I say because that's what I want the answer to be. Cool. I open my textbook. Imagine you can see into the future of a famous person you admire. I point to each word and try to block out the sound of red breathing into the phone. Write at least five sentences in Spanish explaining what will happen to the person tomorrow morning, afternoon, and night. I make it to the end of the directions, but I'm not sure where I'm what I'm supposed to do. The words don't sink in. They fall away and disappear like raindrops off a thick plastic coat. I close my eyes and try to let the stormy sounds help me, help me focus. I need to finish something before dinner. Only Red is still breathing loudly and Mom is rummaging around in the kitchen banging pots and pans together and talking to herself or Henley or someone on the phone. I want to turn off all the noise because it's almost time to eat and I haven't done anything. He's calling, Red says. I want, I want it to be normal like before. Maybe act like it is and it will be. Okay, I mean it can't hurt, he says. Thanks for being the same. No problem, I say, even though right now I really wish it could be different. Clea, mom shouts. I put my pencil down on the blank piece of paper in front of me, shut off the thunderstorm, and walk out of the room. Downstairs, it smells like butter and sautéed vegetables, and I know right away that mom has made the number one best dinner of all time, pasta primavera with homemade spaghetti and vegetarian Caesar salad. Yes! Henley is dancing. This is a long chapter. Very long chapter. Henley is dancing in the middle of the kitchen. Clea's face... Clea's favorite, Clea's favorite, it's your favorite. She points both of her fingers at me and bounces on to her own beat. I know it is, I say, pointing back at her. Mom is standing next to the stove, stirring sauce and balancing the phone between her ear and her shoulder. She isn't saying anything except I totally get that, which means she's probably listening to Mel, her roommate from when she lived in New York City. Mom looks up, smiles at me and points to the empty table. We're on it, I say. Hey, Munchkin, help me set up things. I wave Henley over. Don't call me that unless you're thinking about jelly one. I hate chocolate glazed. <laughs> Since when? I was, I was born, she said, hands on her hip. Get over here, jelly Munchkin. She smiles and follows my lead. I hand her the forks and napkins, and I carry the plates and knives, and we set the table together. Dad, Henley shouts as soon as he walks into the kitchen. Kiddo, he says, trying to match her enthusiasm, which is impossible for any human. He hugs her and then me. It smells great. He takes off his tie, kisses mom hello, and reaches over her shoulder and grabs a piece of the pasta and drops it into his mouth without getting any butter on his blue suit. You too, mom says in the phone and hangs up. She turns around and looks at us. Thank you, girls, for setting the table. Henley smiles so big her eyes squeeze together. Mom tucks her wavy brown hair behind her ears. She picks up the salad and pasta and puts both in the middle of the table, then tells us about her day. How is everyone else's day? Dad asks after we've had a chance to eat. He glances at each of us, waiting for an update. I look into my lap to avoid answering. Loose tooth, Henley opens her mouth and went, opens her mouth wide and wiggles one on the bottom. It's hanging by a thread. Henley, do you remember what we talked about earlier today? Mom says. She nods her head up and down. I have a loose tooth. Her voice is so soft I can barely hear her. That's very exciting, Dad says. I guess it's almost time for the tooth fairy. 
Mom and I both scowl at him. Henley shakes her head and tries as hard as she can to push back her tears, but the but they trickle down her chipmunk cheeks. I don't want that. I know, Mom rubs her shoulder softly. That's why I got you a bag to hang on your door. It looks like a pillow and says special delivery for the tooth fairy only. Henley nods like she remembers. Sorry, Dad mouths to Mom. I, I can't tell if you forgot or if you didn't know. Mom rubs his back with her free hand, which is what she does when she wants us to know that everything is okay, even when it's not. Dad is away a lot. His job is to buy and fix companies. He's the best problem solver around, which means that every few weeks, he's off to a new country or state, but he's always back on Thursday. That's something we all count on. When he gets home, he tries hard to catch up on everything he missed, but it's impossible because things happen. Little things that are so small, they slip away when you aren't looking. And the, thing, the kind of things that don't seem like they even matter until they do. When you add them all up, they matter a lot. How was school? Dad asks. It's quiet for a, few, for a few seconds. I take a big bite of my primavera and then another. Like, I'm so hungry, I didn't hear the question. Henley takes a deep breath. We're going to farm with chickens, pigs, and cows. That sounds like, it sounds like she's racing to get the words out. Like she's afraid if she doesn't, they might disappear. There's a fly on the ceiling circling us, waiting for the best moment to swoop in and join the party. In my head, his name is Floyd. That sounds fun, Dad says. Henley nods. What about you? He looks at me. Floyd lands on the salad bowl. I shoo him away and watch him fly as fast as he can over to the window where I can't see him anymore. Clea, how did your day go? Dad asks again. I beat Sam in chess, I say, because that's the only part of my day I want to talk about. She's the best player on our team. That's great. What about school? He asks, glossing over the win like it hardly mattered. It's actually a really big deal, I say. I dominated. Red even said so. Dad looks at Mom. I can tell they're trading secret adult messages. Floyd is buzzing around again. That stupid fly, Dad swats and misses. Then he stands up and opens a sliding door for Floyd to escape. I wish I could join him. I'd much rather fly around outside and hide in the backyard until this conversation is over. Stupid, 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 Henley repeats and slurps up the last of her spaghetti. Are you finished eating, Mom says. She nods a lot like she's a human bobblehead. Then you may be excused. Henley gets up, pushes her chair, and curtsies. Did, she, did you see? She asks. Very nice, Dad says. We're all quiet while she makes her way into the other room. Hilda, Hilda stays sprawled out on top of my feet. Mom looks at me and puts down her fork. I don't know what's coming, but I can tell it's bad because she waits for Henley to turn on one of her shows before she says, Miss Pumi called. Why? I asked. What did she say? She's worried about you. She says you came to class unprepared. You didn't do your homework. Is that true? I stare into my plate, diving deep into swirls of spaghetti and zucchini. It looks a lot worse when mom says it. It sounds a lot worse when mom says it out loud. You're not in trouble, dad says, and Miss Pumi isn't going to count this grade as long as you do all of your homework from now on. Really? I asked. Dad nods. We want, we want to know what happened. I shrug. I messed up, and then I tried to fix it, and I made it worse. Do you think maybe being on the chess team is too much for you right now? Mom asked. No, I shouted. How is that even related? I saw you practicing chess problems last night, so I thought that maybe why, that is why you didn't have time to finish your homework. Um, it's a lot for anyone to take on. I know you love chess, but school has to come first. It does, I say. It won't happen again. Okay, Mom nods, Mo Mom nods like she's trying to believe me but doesn't. Not really. You can keep... You can keep playing for now as long as you come up with a better plan because what you have been doing isn't working. You have to finish all of your homework at home. I nod because I want, I want to do everything mom is saying and I don't know what's wrong with me. I can't. Uh, after dinner, I go back up to my room and start my homework again. I can't give my parents one more reason to take chess away from me, especially since they don't even know what happened in Spanish yet. Only the lights on the ceiling are buzzing, like there's a bee stuck inside, and I keep looking up and then at the clock instead of reading the questions in front of me. I need to stop messing up now. I still have math and history and science and my art pro my author, author project, and I'm running out of time. It's already 6.45, which is almost 7. I wish the clock would stop for even a few minutes because I have so much left to do. It's all piling up, and it feels like I can't breathe. I close my book and take out my English presentation because I already did the work. And no, the only thing I have left to do is practice. 
I'm standing in the middle of my bedroom, holding up my poster and talking to my imaginary audience. When Henley walks into my room, I hear her, I'm sassy, pajamas. When Henley walks into my room in her, I'm sassy, pajamas. She runs over and hugs the side of my arm, squeezing with all her strength, like she knows I need something. And she's trying in her own way to make sure I get it. Hilda is sleeping in here. She likes your room better, I say. We shall. Not tonight. I want... I want to say yes, but I know Henley needs Hilda more than I do. Not because of the tooth fairy. A few weeks ago, I heard Henley tell Hilda that she's, she's supposed to be talking out loud more at school, and she thinks it might be easier for her to do that if they practice together before bed. I don't want to take that away from her. Henley kisses me on the cheek and then skips over to the door. Good night, I say. I finish practicing my presentation and then plod through my homework. When mom knocks a few hours later, she's wearing a t-shirt and sweatpants with her hair pulled back like she's ready for bed. I look at my phone. It's nine o'clock and I still have so much to do. How's everything going? Mom asks, standing in the doorway. Almost done, I say, because I didn't know the right answer. That's great. Do you need dad or me to help you with anything? I shake my head. No, thanks. Okay, get some rest. I, I will, I say. Good night. As soon as mom walks away, I stand up, turn my desk lamp on, and the ceiling lights off. I close the door to my bedroom. In case mom decides to check on me again, I use an old sweatshirt to cover the small crack between the bottom of the door and the rug so the light doesn't shine into the hallway. By the time I finally finish my homework and climb under the covers, it's really late. I'm tired and out of it. I set my alarm and stare at the ceiling, but now I can't fall asleep. I don't even know how long I try before I give up and turn on an episode of Sabrina the Teenage Witch. <laughs> which is one of my favorite shows. Red and I both love anything with witches and wacky plots. I guess we both like the idea of having magical powers to fix our problems. And that is the end of chapter two. Stay tuned for chapter three.